So, how does one describe Porunjoy? I, I, when I started back in 1992, when I was a trainee reporter, Mr. Guha Thakurda was uh, the dada of journalism. And uh, <laughs> we were in awe of this man who had kind of broken all stories, big stories. And um, we just kind of followed him like little poodles in the office. And, um, but uh, he kind of left Pioneer uh, with a regime change and uh, joined uh, Network 18, uh, where Mr. Porinjoy did what he loves doing, which is talking and getting people to open up and uh, commit themselves to answers which probably they never even thought they would. And uh, he has, since then, continued to um, engage us with issues, um, keep us uh, completely involved on serious issues, um, not just uh, what I mean. His, his interests are, of course, he loves cinema, he loves music. He has a huge collection of all kinds of music, for enjoy. <laughs> Actually, all kinds of music, eclectic. And, uh, but there are some issues that he, he I think, um, after watching him on television, uh, that continue to... Uh, engage him, issues on food security, issues on um, scams. Um, so let me, let me uh, kind of request him to um, once again uh, engage us on issues that we uh, have stopped thinking about of late. Foreign job. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anuradha. Okay, uh, Anuradha flatters me unnecessarily. I pretend to be a student of the political economy of India and the world. I've been a journalist for the last 37 years, and for about 15 years, I tried to become a teacher, a, a writer, a documentary filmmaker, but be that as it may. I, I essentially try and understand the political economy of India and the world, and specifically try and look at the political economy of the media as well. So, um, coming bang in the middle of a three-day conference uh, and not being aware of what has been said before and what is going to be said afterwards, I, there is a real and present danger that I will be saying things which not, you not only know, but you've already been told again and again. But I will take that risk nevertheless and keep my comments as brief as possible so that if you have specific <coughs> questions for me, I'll try and address those questions to the best of my ability. I don't know if I'll be able to answer all your questions. I've been in the business of raising questions and <laughs> not providing answers and, and saying, yes, it's as important to raise the right question than in being able to provide the right answer, which we often don't have. Okay. Um, I'm going to try and talk specifically of media convergence. And in the context of media convergence, look at issues relating to the digital divide. And therefore, we look at relatively disadvantaged sections of the population, how they can, what they should look ahead at if they are to use this so-called new medium called the internet. Now, just a, just a brief kind of a global overview and looking at India, just to tell you where we are, where we have to go, and uh, the ways in which the, the world is moving. And, and, and the absolutely incredible dramatic changes that have been brought about by the internet in, in just about everything we do the way we live, our politics, our economics, our society, just about everything. Okay, but let's also look at the large numbers of people who still haven't used the internet. I don't know, uh, now, these numbers that I'm going to give you are contentious. They can be challenged. Many people say they're inaccurate. But don't take the numbers at face value, but just in look in broad trends. I'm giving very, very rough, approximate figures. In, in the planet that we live in, there are more than 7 billion people as we talk. You know, that figure is somewhere in the region of 7.1 billion people, roughly. Now, it is only this year 
that 40% of the population of this planet use the internet at least once. I mean, you can put it differently. You can argue that a little more than one out of three persons in this planet have used the internet or using the internet. Or put differently, you can say two out of three persons on the planet still are un unsure and unaware of what this brave new world of the internet and the World Wide Web is all about. We, we know it's not just a medium of mass communication. We know it's a medium of personalized communication too. We know it, it, it is our, our newspaper, our magazine, our, our library of books, our radio station, our television channel, everything put together. But it's much more than that because it's also a form of personalized communication. The, the point you need to note, and I think this is where it's important, when we look at the strengths and the diff weaknesses of different media across the world over a period of time, you know, when radio started, it was said, well, who will read it anymore after that? And, and then when cinema came in, people said, you know, who's going to listen to the radio? And then we were told that, the, that video killed the radio star. But the point is, if you look at what's happening across the globe, the biggest medium of mass communication as we talk remains television. It will change, of course it will change. But as we talk, that's the situation. The second point that we have to note is that there is a huge difference in the way the so-called Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, you know, the countries which are developing countries and developed countries are. If you look at the developed world, it's not today, but really over the last 20 years and perhaps even longer that we see a secular decline in the circulation and readership of print, all printed publications, including daily newspapers, and a stagnation and an occasional decline in the number of people who listen to the radio. But we see a continuation of people who are not only use the, using the internet, but also watching television. And now, now you have a curious situation where you find that 24 hours is a finite period of time. How is it that people are spending more time watching television and also spending more time on the internet? Now, there are two reasons for it. Obviously, because the internet enables you to do many things much faster than you were ever, ever able to do. So you save time. And secondly, a phenomenon that you see particularly among young urban professionals is sleep disorders. People are sleeping less. They binge sleep. They sleep for an average of four to six hours, five days in a week, and then over the weekend they hope to catch up on that sleep, which they don't often. So you not only sleep, see sleep-related disorders, you also see the internet as a new form of addiction. And we can debate whether it's worse than addiction to nicotine or alcohol or cocaine. But there are people who are in, in parts of the world who express withdrawal sim symptoms if they do if they're not without the net for a period of time. Now, just a, a broad picture, a broad, broad brush of situation. If you look at North America at the end of 2013, roughly 85% of the population were using the internet, roughly 85%, North America. And in Europe, the figure is surprisingly a little lower. It's about 70%. Again, take these figures with a pinch of salt. I'm, I, I'm using a certain set of figures. You can challenge those figures. This is the world internet statistics, world, world, the world internet statistics, the usage figures that they come. Interestingly, because there are certain parts of the world where it's like 99%, 98%, 99%, like Germany, like Korea. And it's always on, and it's broadband, and it's always on. But when you look at other parts of the world, Africa, it's still 22%. Asia, it's below 33%. These are figures at the end of December 2013 that we are talking about. You break... Asia up, and you look at China and India, 
I mean, it's important to look at China and India because these are the two countries, most populous countries in the world. Forty, almost like forty percent of the world's population is in these two countries. In China, that figure is above forty-five percent, but in India, that figure is below twenty percent. According to the set of statistics I have, it's around sixteen percent. Some people say it's closer to twenty percent. But then, when you look at rates of growth. And this is what is important because you have to look at the way things are going to change in the foreseeable future. If you look at broad trends, like 2000 to 2014, you know, the, uh, take the last 15 years, the slowest rate of growth has actually been in America. It's less than in North America. It's been less than 200 percent, and in Europe, it's been less than 500 percent. Against this, and and in Oceania and Australia, where it's uh, 225 percent, in Latin America, it's 1,500%, 1,500%. In the Middle East, it's 3,000%. In Asia as a whole, it's 1,000%. And wait, Africa, it's 5,000%. So obviously, when you have a very, very low base, it's going to grow. Let's look at some things that uh, we just never could imagine. I mean, I mean uh, let's look at India specifically. India is unique in the world in more ways than one. But when you look at the mass media in India, we are perhaps one of the few countries in the world, and certainly the only major country in the world, where the expansion of television preceded the expansion of telephony. I mean, many of you are, are perhaps not aware that 10 years ago, in 2004, there were more homes with cable and satellite connections with, than, than people with telephone lines including landlines. Today, we have a very, very unusual situation, which none of us could have anticipated. And today, in a country of over 1.2 billion people, you have an estimated 900 million what are called SIM cards, subscriber identity modules. And you have an estimated 70 crore or 70 million handsets. What's a mobile telephone instrument called in Hindi? Hindi bhashi aap koi hai? Okay, the point I'm trying to make is you are having today, and, and this is where we are moving, an entire generation who would be using the internet for multiple purposes, which not even you, your children are going to use it. My children are going to use it. In ways which we couldn't have imagined. So when we talk about convergence, the word convergence is one of those things that means different things to different people at different points of time. Anuradha was gracious enough to describe herself as poodles, you know. You know I, mean, I mean, journalists, you know. There are dogs and there are dogs. And there are journalists and there are journalists. You know? There are some journalists who like to believe they are watchdogs of society. There are watchdogs that can only bark but cannot bite, you know. They, they are very aggressive. There are, then there are the lap dogs. You know, there's so many journalists who are lap dogs. They're very comfortable, especially if the lap belongs to a person who is powerful. He's a big business person. He's a big politician. He's a big <laughs> bureaucrat. But there are also among journalists, and Arun Radha knows them, intelligent guide dogs and, you know, the St. Barnards and those who help a visually challenged person cross the street and who are... So, so when we look at the media, again, we should not look at the media as anything which is mono, monolithic. And, and it, you know, it's very, very tempting when you look at India's media to believe that it is reflecting the heterogeneity and the diversity of this country. Why? Because you have 90,000 publications registered with the Registrar of Newspapers of India. You have 900 television channels which have been given permission by the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting to uplink or downlink. And you have 300 channels which claim to be news and current affairs channels in India, right? Even if you might disagree with that, what they show on the, on that channel is either news or current affairs, you know? Amitabh Bachchan ka Sirdarth can become live-breaking exclusive news, you know? Bhut cited over, Ghost cited over, Kutub Minar can be exclusive, you know? So there are all kinds of stuff that's happening. But all I'm trying to say is we are going through a phase which is actually unprecedented. And let me try and outline some of the points uh, in the hope that I'd be able to bring a certain amount of clarity to the confusion that is prevailing. 
our notions of news our notions of entertainment are undergoing major transformation just as our notion of you know the internet i mean today on youtube you can watch the 9 o'clock news at 11 o'clock or at 3 a.m. because it's on youtube so what is happening when you look at media convergence is that it's meaning different things at different points of time firstly you have one kind of convergence which is vertical in nature that means the content producer is also the content distributor so if z is producing something and dishnet is distributing it it's the same set of guys then you also have what is called horizontal sort of consolidation so the most popular english television channel in the city of mumbai is times now and the most popular english newspaper in china is times of india but they are owned by the same set of people but the the equally important and this is happening across the globe is other forms of convergence which are perhaps not horizontal or vertical but diagonal in nature and that's the difference between what was telecommunications and what is broadcasting has got obliterated so is there a difference between what was traditionally considered telecommunications and what is considered broadcasting so in that sense what we are seeing is despite the apparent heterogeneity and the diversity the media reflects the past structures that are prevalent in society and replicates it very often so despite the apparent numbers you have monopolies and oligopolies that are extremely powerful i'll give you just a few examples this city where we all of you are in at present is the only city in the world with 16 english daily newspapers sounds good except that the top two newspapers account for about 3/4 of the total circulation of all english dailies that's the times of india and the hindustan times so you can ask what are the others doing you know some of them are there because they're sitting on real estate so the fourth estate is real estate there are other other media organizations that are you know extension of uh, political parties or individual with specific political affiliations or they're the extension of an individual's egos as well it could be that you look at what's happening across the the country say the times of india and its different editions they account for about half of the circulation of all english dailies sold in this country and therefore it says and rightly so that is the world's most widely circulated english daily newspaper but you also have a paper called the dainik jagaran which circulates widely in in north india whose readership they claim is almost thrice that of the times of india it may not get that kind of advertising revenue and it considers to itself to be one of the world's most widely circulated multi edition daily newspaper if you go to the website of a body called wan the world association of newspapers you'll get them and you'll see the hindi papers right on top with with the chinese papers and the japanese papers and you will find uh, you know as you move down the list you will find malayalam papers and tamil papers and marathi papers and punjabi papers and bangla papers and so on and so forth i'm making a certain point over here unlike in the west the circulation of newspapers in a country like india is not going down as dramatically in fact people say in 2013 for the first time there was actual drop in the circulation of english newspapers or rather not english newspapers english readers readers of newspapers so in a sense we might be following the trends of what's happening across the world but let me suggest why a you have a very substantial section of the population which still cannot read and write her or his name in the 2001 census this proportion was somewhere around a third in the 2011 census this proportion is roughly around a fourth so there is that divide and if you cannot read and write your own name you can watch television and listen to the radio you can use your thumb impression on an official document but what is your medium of mass communication why am i mentioning all these things is to try and make all of you appreciate the limits that exist today in using the internet 
or the limitations of the internet as it is at present. But these limitations will slowly, slowly, or maybe very fast, change. How soon will the government be able to link 600,000 panchayats in the country? How soon will that optic fiber network roll out? More importantly, you know, are we going to see mobile technology? How is it going to be used? Prime Minister Narendra Modi announced on the 15th of August that by the 26th of January, one person belonging to every household will have a bank account. How are these going to be linked with Aadhaar? It's a separate matter that just opening a bank account may not be the same as financial inclusion. But look at the target. Whether it's achieved or not is a separate issue. You're saying that even today, roughly two out of three households in this country, roughly 40% of the families and households in the country still don't have a bank account. And you're saying you're going to link them all. You're going to provide them with a debit card. You're going to give them an overdraft facility. You're going to give them accidental insurance cover. You're going to give them uh, life insurance policy, whether you will or not. But I'm saying look at the target. So the question is how rapidly will this environment change? How rapidly will more and more people start using computers, the handset? How important will be the handset in accessing things? You know, these are some questions to which I don't have answers, but I'm really asking all of you as activists, as people who are concerned with society, as people who work with ordinary people and underprivileged people, including uh, in particular women, how can you therefore use this medium? How can you, therefore, all I'm first suggesting to you is because of the digital divide, do not underestimate the mainstream media, and it will remain very important. Secondly, understand the limitations of the new medium. And, and the, these limitations, many of these things you've already discussed, the issues of privacy, the issue of anonymity, the issue of information overload, the, the, the big, big issue of the ability to distinguish between what information is authentic, what information is credible, and what is not. These are huge issues. And it goes beyond the issue of the widespread availability of pornography on the internet. Now, the way all of this is going to change gender relations and or not change them is an is a, is a, is a, is a, is a important question. And very honestly, I don't have complete answers, but I'm asking all of you to think because you are engaged uh, in looking at the way people are reacting or not reacting. I mean, just one example. One actor gets arrested in Hyderabad for prostitution. Her name is all over, but not the men who allegedly paid her huge amounts of money. So here is a classic case of the new medium doing things which are not at all different from the way the old so-called traditional media and, and the whole issue of reinforcing stereotypes and which is not the same thing as saying that the new media is not capable of doing things differently. It is today easier for every citizen to become a journalist than ever before. You've had the people from Khabar Lahiriya talking to you. Many of you may be aware of what is happening in this organization called Video Volunteers. It is today easier than ever before for a person with a handset to become a journalist and a video a, 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 a video journalist it is t possible today for an ordinary citizen possible i'm not saying it is will always happen to hold accountable those who are in positions of power and authority hold people those who abuse their discretionary powers it is possible from the local police person to the, the, the most important minister or bureaucrat or corporate captain. It is theoretically possible. But is it happening? No. 
It's not happening. We are moving slowly. What has actually happened in this country, and this is a trend that's being replicated across the world, in 2008, you had this great recession, right? Essentially, what happened was that one of the outcome, or one of the consequences, I should say, of the, of the great recession was that expenditure on advertising and marketing services got sharply curtailed. <coughs> This had a direct impact on the mainstream media, which was heavily dependent on advertising. 90% of its total revenues, 95% of its revenues, many ma major media organizations, including say Times of India or the Bennett Goldman Company Limited, would. But that's not all. The Great Recession saw the, the first media organization went under, was the organization that tried to beat that revenue model, which was world space, the radio where you can get music and no advertising, and you could get music of any size. But what happened after that was this period also coincided with the rapid growth of the internet. So it was almost like a double whammy, because people started saying, why should I pay for what I read and what I view? He, then you say, please, if you want something quality, you know, if somebody has to work very hard, in, in writing something, in researching something, in videographing something, in, in, in providing you information, should you not compensate that person for his or her effort? Will all investigative journalism, if it's not going to be funded by traditional mainstream organizations, then who? Would only civil society organization and NGOs or, or quangos and, 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 and quasi-government bodies be funding investigative journalism? So we know, yes, we need investigative journalism. We need journalism which will hold accountable those who are in positions of power and authority, but who's going to pay for it? I've made a documentary film and said, I couldn't spot it on YouTube. I said, no, it's not on YouTube. Why is it not on YouTube? I said, because I've invested a certain amount of money, I haven't recovered it. Will you take this DVD for me and give me 200 rupees? I'm saying, you want everything free? Your kids haven't bought music, and you know that? When we were young, we paid money to buy whatever, vinyl discs or audio cassettes or CDs. Today you not, don't want to pay money. <coughs> I'm seeing the combination of the Great Recession in the West, in countries like India and China, we don't like the R word, we call it the economic slowdown. But all of it has squeezed revenues, traditional media organizations. At the same time, what has happened is that uh, the internet has expanded and, and everybody wants everything free, of course. So this has completely disrupted the working of the media in India and across the world. And I don't think we are going to see a, a very easy kind of resolution of many of these issues. This process of disruption, mergers, acquisitions, you know. In, in India, a few thousand journalists have been thrown out of their job in, in the last few uh, years. Anuradha is lucky. She gets a monthly salary. We don't know when Mr. Rajan Raheja will suddenly say, oh, I've had enough of funding outlook. You guys are left liberals. What the hell? Why should I be uh, doing all this kind of stuff? No, uh, I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but the way media is being owned, the way media is going to be owned, is you have a very curious kind of a situation. The media is reflecting a lot that has gone wrong with, say, in India, our society. And there's a huge amount of corruption in the media in India. But you also see sections of India, uh, the media in India still trying to play that traditional role of being the fourth estate. The, the watchdog who can bite and not the watchdog that who can only bark and not bite, or even sometimes the intelligent guide dog. So there is the media and there is the media. You will, in, your, in the course of your work, meet all kinds of media people, and you'll have to cultivate the media people who are far more sympathetic, empathetic, and sensitive to what you're doing. But in this kind of a churn that is taking place, 
I have tried to outline the challenges that exist to highlighting issues relating to injustice. You know, it's, it's very simple. I mean, the, for the editor of that mainline English newspaper, the, the death of a farmer or, or the suicide of a farmer is not newsy enough. If a wardrobe malfunction takes place of a model on a ramp, that is like front page stuff. You know, okay, these are mindsets that are going to remain. They're not going to disappear altogether. I mean, the commercialization, the commoditization of women, of the media is, is real. Can you imagine it's, it's after how many years that the Advertising Standards Council of India is finally saying, you know, all these fairness screens, we should be doing something about it. I mean, we should have some guidelines, some norms about these fairness screens that we are, you know, uh, fair and ugly or whatever you call it, uh, fair and ugly cream and, uh, you know, brought by the biggest multinational or one of the biggest multinationals on the planet, you know. Unilever, Hindustan Unilever. They control the levers of the universe. That's why they were called Unilever. <laughs> That's an old sort of uh, Marxist uh, crack. But, but, but the point is, look at the slow pace of change that is happening despite the media. So yes, it's all very fine for us to say, look how the new media has empowered. Would Tahrir Square have happened? Would, would, would uh, Ben Ali have been thrown out? You know, would, would we have got the kind of... Uh, um, you know, the, uh, what's happening in Kashmir or, or anything, you know, I mean, and, and a lot of it is attributed to the new media. But I'm merely here trying to suggest be aware of the limitations, the challenges, and, and, and the problems that the new media also poses. And, and if you are aware of that, then you might be in a better position to better use the new media to achieve the, uh, the goals and, and uh, assist the endeavors that all of you are engaged in. Uh, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you for joy. Um, of course, in this traditional media as well as the new media, the representation of women, uh, there are still no women editors as far as I know. Very few, very few maybe just two. Uh, there are no Dalit editors. And uh, we still have malnutrition, which is 40%. That's the reality of the online wo offline world, which seldom gets reflected on the offline world. So thanks. I mean, those are the divides that we have to confront with, actually, apart from the digital divide. So questions for Paranjoy? Now, I just wanted to comment, actually, uh, uh, what you said about the fair and ugly uh, creams. IDWA had already filed a lot of petitions, and there have been protests. So what I'm saying is that there has to be an offline pressure. How slow or not? And we are regularly you know, complaining at the Advertising Council website and everything. And also looking at the limitations, I think one should not be discouraged in the sense what we have with what optimum level we can use. And sometimes, the new media also feeds into the main media. Uh, and just taking from each other and complementing and supplementing each other than taking it as a competition. I think that's the best way we could utilize both media. I, I, uh, Kamaniji, I entirely agree with you. You know, it's, it's like the same thing, that if, uh, if Husni Mubarak had not been a terrible tyrant, if Ben Ali's wife wasn't stashing away so much of the of her money in in jewelry in in, in Switzerland, then the the death or, or the, the suicide of an educated veget fruit and vegetable peddler on the streets would not have sparked that so-called jasmine revolution, the Arab Spring, call it what you like, and and all the attempts by Mubarak's regime to stop the use of the internet in Tariq Square would have come to naught. So in a sense, you are absolutely correct. The, the, the brick in the motor world and the cyber world, and we're trying to understand how these two 
act is very very important and and you are completely right and i i agree with you 100% that the new media can be used like what are essentially called force multipliers but beware of trolls beware of that the guys who can use that the same tools to not just offend but that to to cut you down it, it, it's that old uh, the scalpel analogy that it can be uh, in in a skilled surgeon's hands that scalpel can be used to heal because it will remove a disease part of your body but in the hand of somebody else it can be used to murder and maim and which is this because today and this is something you realize it's not individual aberrations anymore these are organized rackets if somebody you know just for the heck of it wants to has a lot of money and wants to trash you can actually engage the services of a body who will do nothing but tell the whole world why kamaini is a terrible human being i mean it's not that it may or may not affect your life but that capability exists